LNG TV, the official media partner for the World LNG Summit and Awards 2021. Well, we are here at the World LNG Summit. It is coffee break time, so it's a little bit noisy in the background, but I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Miles from BakerBots. I say Stephen Miles from BakerBots, but Stephen, it's been a, a different 18 months for you, and you're now involved with the Baker Institute. How are you enjoying that? Well, well thank you, Ali, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and, and speak with you today. Um, it has been an interesting 18 months for quite a number of reasons for all of us, but uh, coincident with everything else happening, I uh, retired from the partnership at Baker Butts. I've been practicing law for 35, 36 years, uh, headed the LNG team there for uh, the last 20 years or so. Gosh, that seems long. Um, and um, I, I had enjoyed that. Uh, we have a fantastic team of people there, some of whom are on your show. Uh, and I'm really so proud of them. But I just wanted to do something a little bit different at this point in life. And so uh, I was offered a fellowship at the Baker Institute, uh, the Center for Energy Studies at Rice University. Uh, and so I'm having the opportunity to learn what it's like in, in uh, somewhat academia, I suppose, uh, as a fellow for global gas and energy transitions. I think I got it all out there right. So LNG is still obviously a big part of your, your working life. Um, how would you describe 2021, the market, and as much surprised you this year? Yes. Yes, a lot has surprised me. I'll, I'll start with the things that haven't. I'm not surprised at the growth of demand for LNG. Um, in particular, uh, I'm very pleased to see the reemergence of the Sino- North American LNG trade, uh, which had been written off by quite a few people. Uh, I had the opportunity, together with Ken Medlock, uh, the director of the Center for Energy Studies at the Baker Institute, to write a paper, a policy brief, in March of 2020, where I talked about uh, how molecules and money could overcome geopolitics and how uh, this could become a, a key part of the energy trade and one positive element in that um, bilateral relationship. Uh, I took some flack for that, actually, uh, from, uh, from others who said, ah, oh, straight is dead, it's never gonna happen. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm gratified to see that, in fact, um, that uh, even if it's because of energy needs, uh, whatever it may be, energy security, um, nonetheless, the two sides are finding opportunities to work together, to trade, to invest, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy to see that. And do you feel that that momentum, with all those SPAs being put in place in, in Q4 this year, do you see that that momentum carrying on to next year and, and supply projects getting sanctioned? I do. Um, it, it's going to be different. <laughs> so we used to say that the long-term agreements were everything. Once we or a project sponsor had their agreements in place, financing would follow automatically. You'd go into EPC construction. Three or four years later, you'd be built out. You'd be shipping cargoes. That linkage may be different now in that I think uh, in this part of the panel that I'll be moderating tomorrow with some fantastic speakers, I, I think the investment and lending communities are trying to figure out where COP26 leads them and where and what an ESG world means for them. If it means we're not doing any fossil fuel projects ever again, that takes the world down one path. It's a path that includes a lot of energy poverty for major parts of the world that don't have access to other forms of energy yet and aren't likely to have them for some time, but that is a path. Then there's another path that says, okay, we're going to fund natural gas and LNG because for the next X years, uh, because they replace, they supplant coal, hopefully molecule for molecule. That is every cargo of LNG that we send to somewhere like China is that much less coal that China's burning and coal has perhaps the most deleterious effect on the climate of all the fuels. And so anything we can do in the short term to, to stop or retar even retard the growth of coal that is continuing in major economies, not picking on any particular ones, but you can't ignore India and China, um, that 
would have a material positive impact on, on the amount of CO2 and greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So I think the investment community is trying to figure out what does it mean? So do you think that policy is going to override prices when it comes to the impact with the fallout from COP? The, the two cannot be disjointed for long. If policy leads, which I think it's, I think it's what is going to try to happen, you, you'll have price signals that will be reflected in that. And some people say that's what's happening right now. And, and you can argue either side of it, but a lot of people say, gosh, look at the, the price of energy in Europe, in the UK, look at the price of energy even in the United States, which is an energy-rich country, resource-rich country at the moment, um, that, that just, uh, that's a reflection of the hard turn in policy. Maybe, maybe not, but I do believe it is the case. I don't think we can escape that policy has ramifications, and those ramifications will be reflected in price. So I think the two will never be disjointed for very long. And um, regarding decarbonization, obviously something that you um, work with daily, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on the industry at the moment. How do- And rightfully so. And, and how, how do big players gain trust in the decarbonization activities? So this is a fantastic point. And, and one that I've had the opportunity to ask, you know, how are things going at the Baker Institute? This is what I write about more than anything else. And uh, the dream would be to have standardization. I say the dream because that would require, if we had standardization, then it would be very clear exactly who was doing what and who was talking the talk and who was walking the walk. That's a bridge that's, a pr that's pretty far because we don't even have agreement within any one country, let alone all countries, and we don't have agreement within the industry, let alone government uh, or academia. So there's, there's so much that needs to be done, so much knitting together that needs to happen among these groups and these geographies to be able to come up with standardization. We have to get there, but it's not gonna be this year or next. What we can do immediately is transparency. And that, that's where I think our first step should be, which is kind of like an FDA food label. So in the States, the Food and Drug Administration, you have this exactly the same thing, different name, which is you, know, you, you pick up a can of, of something in the supermarket, right? And it says what's in it and how much and the percentage, and, right? And that's something we can go towards very quickly. Not necessarily mandating yet, it'll take time what the standards are, but let's just each be clear about what is, what's in a cargo of LNG, for example, or any other fuel or energy, and what isn't. And then we, buyers, buyers know, and investors know. Now, it gets interesting because then you get into a trading world, right? So when we have a point-to-point -point business, when, you're, when a buyer is buying long-term cargoes from a seller, and that seller or the buyer bringing the, the molecules all the way from the upstream, downstream, all the way through, you can, you can track, you can understand, you can almost see what the carbon content and the other contents are. But when a buyer is buying from a liquid hub, which is increasingly the case with NBP or TTF in Europe, has been the case with Henry Hub and, and other places in the United States for uh, quite a while, then it's very hard to point and say, well, that came from that good well or that came from that bad well because Methane, natural gas, once they're intermingled, commingled in a pipeline, it's, it's a commodity. So we have to work on the trading aspects, but the extent to which we can come up with a, a certificate of, um, of ingredients, a uh, good housekeeping certificate, uh, I think at least everyone will know. And then the market and the population and policymakers, investors, and lenders can allocate resources and make their decisions accordingly. And is there much, do you feel there's much resistance in the industry to being transparent or trying to create a, 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 a binding policy? I don't sense any overt resistance. There are, as in everything, there are leaders and then there are others who are catching up or watching. Uh, I think that um, in North America, I think there's a better story that exists than they're telling. I think we're a little late to the game, to the party, uh, compared to our European brothers and sisters in particular. 
But I think that's changing quickly. Uh, I think there, I know that there are quite a few companies that are working very, very hard, both upstream companies in the U.S. and LNG exporters, to now turn turn the ship, turn the the direction this is going, and um, and and work affirmatively on decarbonization upstream, reducing methane emissions, reducing uh, uh, flaring, um, and um, to the extent to which we're buying or selling uh, carbon credits to decarbonize the downstream piece, uh, having those be real. Um, I think that's one of the biggest challenges for uh, the decarbonization of our industry is some of the credits that people are selling or trading or claiming are uh, perhaps, um, let's just call them difficult to measure in fact. And, and that, how do you see 2020 progressing with that in mind? Or what are your, what are your hopes, your wish list? Or For the coming year? Yeah. Well, we have COP26 in the rearview mirror only one month ago. Yeah. So, uh, and, what do, and what came out of that? Well, we have the, uh, the methane uh, pledge by, uh, to reduce methane by 30% by 2030 compared to 2020. Uh, that was started by the UK, EU, and US, and we now have uh, 100 countries that have signed on. So that's a very important um, step. That really was just about a month ago, a month and a half ago. At about the same time, um, the US, UK, and EU, and 17 other countries agreed to um, end the public financing of foreign uh, fossil fuel projects, with some important exceptions, but it's a pretty strong statement. So we have to see how that works itself out also. Uh, that has a much, that will bite much sooner, it will bite in one year. Uh, I think the UK said end of this year, uh, the others is end of next year. Uh, that will have a big impact, um, will particularly have a big impact in lesser developed countries. I mean, that's where that finance goes. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not financing European and American projects with, you know, these, this public financing, World Bank and otherwise, Exim Bank and so on, this is, um, these are for uh, other jurisdictions for the most part. Um, so we'll have to see how that works itself out. Again, that's something we'll be talking about in our session tomorrow. Um, and then just the, you know, uh, the European uh, proposal for uh, border carbon adjustment or as we call it on our side of the pond, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's, you know, two countries separated by common language, right? Tomato, tomato, <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, you know, that really is going to affect things. Uh, there are somewhat incompatible proposals, in, you know, be, uh, being proposed in Canada, in the United States, and elsewhere. So you're gonna have these big gears that really will, will move things in terms of global economy and trade, and they're sort of all going different directions, and those have to get harmonized, so that, that'll affect some things. So, what are my hopes for 2022? Forward, ever forward. It seems like quite a pivotal point in the industry. It is, it is. I, I think uh, it's an exciting time. This has never been a non-exciting industry, I have to tell you. 35 years in this industry, I got into it fighting the fight for energy security. You know, in the early 1980s, and uh, you know, I was a child. I basically, you know, was in college and grad school during the two uh, energy crises, and so I came up wanting to fix and work on energy security. And we're doing that again. It's just a different type of security. Yeah, an important one for and future an important generations. One. Absolutely. But the bell is gone. The next session is starting soon. Thank you very much for joining us, Stephen Mars. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been wonderful to have you here on LNG TV.